Welcome to the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society. Welcome to ITSP Magazine Podcast Radio. You're about to listen to an episode of Tech Done Different Podcast with Ted Harrington. Do you follow the pack or challenge the status quo? Join Ted as he explores how to succeed by going against conventional wisdom. You'll hear leaders in technology and security tell stories about how they achieve their success by doing things differently. Knowledge is power. Now, more than ever. Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Tech Done Different. I'm your host, Ted Harrington, and with me here today is a very dear friend, a classmate from Georgetown, Jeff Savilico. Jeff, welcome to the show. Super pumped to be here, Ted. Thanks for having me, man. So Jeff, I'm going to brag about you a little bit, and then you can brag about you if you want to. I love it. <laughs> so Jeff, you are a world champion juggler. You had a strip. Yeah, uh, you had a show in the Las Vegas Strip. You're an MC for live events, and now this like super sought after MC for virtual events. You serve Georgetown as uh, I believe on the board of governors. Uh, you started a charity that's this amazing thing that I definitely want to uh, get into and ask you about. So really, my first question to you is, what the hell? What, what are the rest <laughs> of us supposed to like? How are we supposed to keep uh, up with you? Uh, you're way too kind, man. You're way too kind. I don't know. I've just uh, going back to Georgetown. I remember graduating. and I remember I had always been entertaining ever since I was a little kid. And so all through high school, all through college, I was doing shows in D.C. I was performing on cruise ships during the summer. And I saw everybody else going on these more traditional career paths, doctor, lawyer, merchant, chief, you know, the, the kind of more traditional road. And I thought, I really love what I'm, what I'm doing right now. I'm good at it, yeah, making good money. And I want to just see how far and how long I can go doing this. I want to continue to up the game and keep pushing it. I don't want to be bored creatively. Uh, I, and I want to do well financially. So I thought, if there's ever a time when this just isn't working, like, okay, cool. I'll go to law school or I'll, <laughs> I'll like, you know, go transition to sales. People are always say, Oh my God, you'd be amazing at real estate, you know, you know, sales at any capacity because it's a lot of people skills and connections and networking and hustle and all that. Um, and fortunately I'm now what I'm 37. So 16 years out and, and I haven't, uh, had, had to do that. I haven't had any desire to do that because fortunately, Things are things are still going well, despite uh, a lot of uh, a, a, a lot of crazy roller coaster rides. Yeah, indeed. So let's talk about your your success or um, your experience in being a you know a performer on the Las Vegas Strip. You certainly achieved the pinnacle of success in what it was you're setting out to go do. I mean, that's what everyone wants to do. They want to be a Vegas headliner, and you did it. Uh, and you did it at a young age too. Um, yeah. So let's talk about some of the requirements to do that because as as I understand it, many of the things that you had to do are directly applicable to some of the same challenges that our audience has who are not themselves uh, <laughs> entertainers. Wait, are you are you telling me that this audience isn't <laughs> isn't for, for jugglers, magicians, ventriloquists, acrobats? Well, Come maybe we now. should have it become a jugglers <laughs> podcast moving forward. Right. <laughs> you might have to introduce me. You're the only juggler I know. So, yeah, done, done. Uh, <laughs> but I wanted to ask you about the people's arch. So maybe you could tell our audience about this concept and what you were up against and why you had to do it. Sure. Yeah, I love it. And I love that you, you know, the people's arch, I believe you donated to the people's arch which is pretty awesome. So thank you for that. Uh, your $10 was very much appreciated. Um, really, I asked for a $10 donation in exchange for tickets to my show to crowdfund my set. And I'll, I'll get back to that about why I had to crowdfund my set. It wasn't just because I had no money, uh, which also is true. It was literally a space issue. I was an afternoon show and afternoon shows um, are not as uh, well regarded, highly perceived as the evening shows because you can't charge as much for them, right? They don't employ as many of the crew and the staff. So it was like, yeah, yeah, you can do your show here, but like, here's your space. And it was this little corner cage, you know, where I could like put my trunk of props. Like that was it. And, and I'm looking at this massive stage and I'm thinking, I, I need a set. Like everybody else had sets. There was like the band was playing a multi level. 
right? S- rotating stages and I this set this uh, stage just swallowed me, right? Because I'm this little shrimpy shrimpy guy in this 800 seat venue, and so I started b- brainstorming the idea of an inflatable set because um, I had seen that Elton John had an inflatable set at uh, Coliseum at Caesar's Palace, so I started designing this inflatable set and. Um, I, I hadn't ever seen anybody crowdfunding a, a set, but I knew I had a good story with always wanting to have a Las Vegas show. And, uh, I thought people could get behind it. And so I, I created this, uh, crowdfunded set where for $10, you got tickets to the show. And then when you got, came to the show, you got to sign the arch, um, which was pretty cool. So it was this, this big 40 foot inflatable arch that filled up the entire stage with color and kind of became a running gag throughout my show because the show started with uh, me like with a bike pump pumping up the set and and towards the end of this big crescendo the spotlight would hit me as I'm as I'm pumping up like the last you know couple seconds of of the uh, the set and so then periodically throughout the show I would have to run back over and like pump up the set you know I so I would it. bring a kid up and I would have the kid you know just on the side like pumping it and I'd be doing my show and you know like I'd look over and I'd see the kid would stop and I'd be like what are you doing, bro? Come on, like, <laughs> let's go. Right. And so just ways to be very authentic. I wasn't trying to be somebody that I wasn't right. I was a one man self-produced show with a very limited budget. And so I just tried to use that to my advantage. Um, but back to Vegas in general, you mentioned that I, that th- that was the goal, right. And that really was ever since I was a kid, I dreamed of having my own show on the Las Vegas strip. And that's, that's, I think it's a testament to the power that Vegas has as a brand because I'm 10 years old doing shows in my kitchen and I'm like, I got to make it to Vegas, baby. <laughs> like, I got to get to Vegas. Like, that's incredible. I don't even know what that means. I don't even know what Vegas is, but I knew if you had your own show in Las Vegas, that was like an official stamp, you know, that you were a great performer. You, you've made it. And so that was always the goal. Then when I got to Vegas in my early 20s, I realized uh, this is going to be a little harder, harder than I thought. Um, most people don't go to Las Vegas and then try to get on the show on the strip, right? They have a career, uh, that let's say they tour and then they like park it in Vegas for a while, right? It doesn't really work like that, that you go to Vegas and like go to auditions for a seven o'clock show at the Venetian. You know what I mean? Like that, it doesn't really work that way. Um, but I tried to, I tried to just really be smart about what I was seeing and from the marketing perspective and from budgets. And I try to come at it from a different way. And uh, I learned a lot by being part of another show in Vegas first, where I got to just kind of see what was happening. And it was one of these classic situations in Las Vegas where performers get paid if the show makes money, right? Like that's a lot of what it is. It's like, hey, you get to perform six days a week, you know, for fun. And if the show makes money, like you'll make some money too. And it's like, okay, great. That's a lot of how, how this worked, right? Or, or you, you get some guarantee. Like um, I used to get paid 25 bucks a show uh, when I first started at the Flamingo to be in another, a bigger show, right? Obviously it's not even enough to live on. Um, it's like a stipend. Um, so anyway, so I was fortunate enough to be a part of a show where I didn't have any control over the budget, but I could see what was happening and I could learn what they were doing to market and promote the show. And they made what I thought were a lot of mistakes Um, in the marketing promotion, just like I was watching where they were dumping money. And it just seemed like so stupid to me. Like, why would you pay? Why would you pay 20 grand for a billboard at the Las Vegas airport with the name of our show on it, when nobody knows who we are, right? Or what we do. So it's one thing if you see a billboard that says like Backstreet Boys, because then your, your, your mind creates the advertising for you. You're like, oh, yeah, like guys dancing around the dance moves like, oh, bye, bye, bye. Like, you kind of know what that means. But if you see, you know, the show is called Amazed. So if you see a show called Amazed and there's like a picture of me, picture of a guy, uh, picture of a magician, like you don't know what that is, mm-hmm. right? And you don't you don't care. Your mind doesn't complete the rest of the marketing. So anyway, I would see things like that where I'm like, that's that's a poor use of marketing dollars. So I was able to get this experience learning about marketing why I wasn't spending any of my own money. And after that show went under, because it was obvious it was going to go under, uh, I learned a lot and I thought, okay, I, I think I could do this better myself if I were in control of, of the budget. So that was kind of the seed. And then from there, I just thought about how do I do this as a, as a self-produced one-man show? And it was all about the story. It was all about the narrative, right? Because you have these big corporations like the Cirque du Soleil, et cetera. There's no personality there. There's no, there's no personal connection 
to any of those performers, right? People want to see a Cirque show. They don't want to see that person. So I made it, I made it kind of a goal of mine to get to know every ticket broker on the strip. I would walk the strip every day with like duffel bags full of Jolly Ranchers and taking selfies with everybody, do little tricks here and there and get these personal connections. I would go to call centers and I would perform. Um, you know, I would go to charity events. I'd be on local TV. I'd do radio shows. And so when you're the guy on the rack card, actually on the advertisement, there's power there because, you know, you look at like Chris Angel on the rack card, like Chris Angel's not going to be stopping by the tickets for tonight booth. Right. So, and no knock against him. Like he doesn't have to, right. He's, he's made it to a point where everybody knows what that means, who, who that is. Whereas for me, when I would build these personal connections with these ticket brokers, with these agents, these concierge, uh, concierge community that was selling my show, they would, they would recommend me to the family of four that walks up from Des Moines and says like, I want to see a show. Like, who should we go see? And they say, well, you know, this guy's really awesome. He's kind of a hidden gem. Uh, it's a low price point. You know, it's an afternoon show. So you can still go to this dinner that you want or see this other show. And so they started pushing me, um, which, which was great. So it really was kind of a, a guerrilla marketing style um, word of mouth where I wanted people, I wanted people to want me to succeed and to really kind of um, push me as the underdog one man self-produced show because that is increasingly rare in Las Vegas. Um, you know, you have the Britney Spears uh, the J Lo's uh, and, you know, now with the Raiders and the Vegas golden Knights, you know, you have these massive brands with massive budgets and marketing teams behind them. It's very rare to have a one man self-produced variety show. So I mean, just a little context there about Vegas. Yeah, it's it's interesting the themes that I see drawn out of what you just described. Certainly, you know, hustle being one of them, another being building relationships and using those in order to overcome constraints that you saw. I mean, certainly anyone listening to the show has constraints, whether that's they don't have enough people, they don't have enough budgets, they don't have enough time, that whatever they don't have enough of, that is omnipresent in every company in the world. And you're revealing some strategies for how you've dealt with that by being creative and sort of thinking differently. I mean, you were competing against Cirque du Soleil, right? And right. you've been able to do that. So yeah. when we think about, um, you're obviously very passionate about being uh, an entertainer. And what's, stri I mean, I am I know this from many, many years, you know, almost 20 years now. Wow, don't don't tell anybody that, but it's been 20 <laughs> years we've, we've been you see these grays? You see these grays? <laughs> I, I commented God, I on your grays. grays in college. <laughs> I know, I'm like a spotted dog. These passes. I know. You're, anyway, you're, these were not here. These are Corona grays. These were not here like six months ago. Very distinguished looking. Yes. Now, yes. You're the uh, <laughs> the whatever that hair color, hair for men or whatever that is. You're like the guy just on the box, like salt yeah, and pepper. Just for men. Yeah. That's what we want to look like. You're that. Uh, yeah. yeah. I, I need um, a monocle now. <laughs> <laughs> so 20 years ago, you did not look like that. But yeah. so I'm I'm of course applying some of what I know about you from having known you for a very long time. But but these principles certainly revealed in what you were just talking about. You're very passionate about it. And that's sort of like a, um, it's almost overplayed this idea of like, you know, pursue your passion. And, and anytime I hear anyone say that, I'm always like, well, what the hell does that mean? You know, how can you get, how can someone get a paycheck with their passion? So if you look back on maybe your journey, what would the advice be to someone else who has a passion? Maybe they're passionate about security. Maybe they're passionate about technology. Maybe they're passionate about something else. Mm -hmm. What's the advice? So this reminds me of Seth Godin. I love Seth Godin, big, big Seth Godin yeah. fan. I'm not going to try to claim this is my own, but he always says that passion is not project specific. It's people specific. And by that, he means that passionate people find ways to channel their passion. They find avenues that their passion pours through. And that might, I get this all the time. Like, ah, oh, you're, you're, you're you're so lucky. You're so rare. Like you knew what you wanted to do since you were nine, you know, like, and, and that's, I don't, I'm not like that. Right. You think of like, Oh, this girl was like an ice skater and she's been following this one passion. She always wanted to be an Olympic gold medalist. Now she did it. She, but, right. So like kind of, but not really, because I'm not passionate about juggling. Right. I'm, I'm not, I don't care about juggling. I care about connecting with people. And so what I learned from a very early age is that juggling was a medium. It was kind of a way that I could break the ice and connect with folks of all ages, races, backgrounds, uh, genders, et cetera. So it was uh, never about the juggling. It was about the the people and the, and the performing and the connecting. 
Um, and now increasingly it's about the freedom that working for myself gives me. So yes, I've had a lot of great opportunities be directly tied to performing. Um, traveled the world, been able to, I did a show for Ericsson. I hosted their incentive trip in the Maldives. Like that was incredible. Um, I, FedEx offices event in, in Portugal and like I could go on and on these great, amazing events. And I, and I love that. But at the end of the day, I love being able to control my own schedule. And that's very important to me to work for myself. So when you talk about passion, I, I would say like, I know a lot of your audience is um, security folks, tech folks, right? Mostly. And maybe they are really passionate about what they do. And that's, that's great. But maybe they are not specifically passionate about the X's and O's, right? The, the details, but they're passionate about making people feel safe or secure or helping people build companies and to build a great company increasingly now today, you have to be very tech savvy. You have to have a really good sense of security, right? So maybe, maybe they're help, help, you know, maybe they're passionate about allowing other people to build their dreams and employ multiple uh, people and kind of change the world for the better through technology. Obviously security is a huge piece of that. So I think my advice would be, don't be looking for the passionate project. Like, Oh, I got to find this thing that I'm passionate about because honestly it, it frustrates people, right? Cause they, they get annoyed. They're like, this person's so lucky they have guitar, right. Or singing or, you know, even economics, like people are, are passionate about economics or epidemiology or whatever, right? Like it doesn't have to be the, the, like the childhood hobby that you turned into a career. Um, I would say stop trying to find that and just focus on becoming a more passionate person, really like embracing life and, and what you want out of life. And I think the projects will naturally flow from that. The ways that you, that you pour out your passion will, will kind of come naturally from that. Once you have really learned to embrace life more and, and just being happy, like being genuinely being happy every day um, and knowing what you need to do to be happy, whether it's like meditating, working out, you know, ha having a strong relationship, connecting with your, with your peers, uh, whatever that is for you. Oh man, I, I love that. And that, that resonates really powerfully with me personally as well. Uh, over the past few months, we've been going through this process with our company to really evangelize to everybody what the vision is and the mission and where we're going. And it's something that um, we've just wanted to continue to do better. And I feel like maybe we hadn't been doing as well in the past. And what was so interesting to me through this, this process, now this is a security consulting company. We look like we're in the business of delivering security services. And what I heard from a lot of our people as we were having these discussions is they're like, I mean, yeah, I like security, but what I really like is, and then they talked yes. about what we are doing for our customer. And it's exactly what you just said, right? It's a medium. Yeah. Outcomes. Like they, they, they probably really passionate about the outcomes, right? About when you do a great job for somebody and they're super happy or God, I mean, if they have a government, they have a security breach, you know, they're going to lose data, things, and, and you can fix that for them. You can solve their problem. Like what's, what's better than solving people's problems? Oh man. And Nothing. I tell you. <laughs> yeah, seriously. It's, I'm going to put on awesome. a bumper sticker with Jeff's. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about making strategic decisions. You've, you've obviously been making them throughout the course of your career. You've already enumerated a few of them. One of the ones that has that when you first told me about it, when I first heard about it, I was really almost surprised by, but then when you explained it, it was like, oh my God, this makes total sense to me. But you, you worked so hard to establish a show on the Las Vegas Strip and then you voluntarily ended it. Yeah. I, you know, Can I you tell me about lot. your thinking there? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's a lot more to do. Like, I, it, was, it was awesome. I, a decade on the Strip was enough. Um, it was great. I loved it. Um, it's kind of feel like I feel like college, man. You know, some people are like, man, like that was the best days of my life. It's like, I think, yeah, college was awesome, but like I've had many better days than college. Like my life, I feel like my life's just gone up since college. College was awesome. But there was that sense of like holding on to the past, right? Or holding on, like it's never going to be better than this. It's like, I don't, I don't believe that. Right. And that's a, I think that's a bad way to look at life. And so for me, I loved having a show on the strip and, um, and all that that could afford me, right, in terms of leverage um, and, and being able to to do do things with that, right? So you say you've got a show on the strip. I mean, I, I say this to my friends all the time. Like, you're an entertainer. You're sitting on an airplane. And you say, oh, you know, you're an entertainer. Like, 
But what do you do? If you say, oh, I do some shows around here and there, people are like, oh, that's cool. If you say, what do you do? I say, oh, I've got a show at the Flamingo. Like, you know, you can see me six nights a week. People are like, mm, right this way. Like <laughs> they, they just look at you a little differently, right? They're like, oh, like this guy must be good. It's like an official stamp. You know, I, honestly, it's like I said, when I was seven years old, it's an official stamp that you're good at what you do and that um, people are aware of that. So anyway, yeah, I, I voluntarily uh, hung up the unicycles, uh, hung up my uh, hung up my shoes, um, at, you know, from the show because I didn't want to ever be like a lifer. I didn't want to be somebody who, when you look at people, be like, ah, like yeah, you probably should have stopped doing that a few years ago, right? Because it happens pretty quick. Like, uh, you know, it's cliche, but I blinked and I was like on the strip for ten years because uh, it's kind of like Groundhog Day. Every every day is the same. You know, you always have the show in the back of your mind. So even if you have a seven o'clock show. Like you're at a barbecue with your friends, this and that. You're always kind of like, ah, like a certain time I've got to flip into show mode. Like whether it's five o'clock, I need to like go home, grab my stuff, do this, or go to the theater, warm up. And so it's hard to really be present and enjoy your life day to day when you have that show. And I could have like a killer day, right? I could wake up at 5 a.m. and do all these amazing things, but the world judges me on how I perform from 7 to 8.15. So if I have this killer day and I'm kind of exhausted and I'm like, oh man, I'm beat and I don't give my best when everybody else is, is, is like, mm, let's see what this kid can do, right? right? That's when they're all judging me. Then it, it, it affects in, in a negative way all, all of what I did during the day, right? So you really have to make sure that you're bringing your A game no matter what's going on in your life. So I just knew there was more out there. I, I wanted to do more. I wanted to do more speaking like you on um, the speaking circuit. Um, I wanted to do more hosting of live events. I wanted to take the show on the road. Um, the road is really fun uh, until it's not right. When you're on the road all the time, uh, it's, it's not right. So I was on the road all the time before Vegas. And then in Vegas, I would occasionally go for uh, an event here and there, but I kind of missed traveling and being on the road and taking, taking the show to different groups of people all over the country and, uh, experiencing that again. So I just knew, I had to, I knew it was, here's actually Ted, here's how I knew it was the right thing to do because I knew that my ego was going to miss it. And I was like, that's not a good reason to keep doing your show on the strip so that you can drive by your billboards and be like, Hey, that's me. Like I've got a show on the strip. Like you can see your stuff at the airport when you land, all that stuff is, is, it's just ego. Right. So like I, it does feel weird living here because the turnover is insane, right? Like you have a show on the strip for 10 years and then the next week, like, it's like, who, who's that guy? Oh, he was like a, the juggling comedian guy. Like, yeah, I mean, there's just, there's 50 shows waiting in line to jump in your spot as soon as you stop, right? Um, and all those rack cards and billboards and magazines and print ads and taxis and the mobile trucks, like all that stuff, it, it's just gone. Mm -hmm. So um, I, again, I realized, if the only reason I want to still be doing this is to satisfy that sense of like, oh yeah, like I'm successful. Look, I've got a show on the strip. Then like, that's ridiculous. Um, and I, and I realized that that's the only reason I would be hanging on. So. And that's a lifetime designation too. You're forever had a, a, a show on the strip. So that's yeah. really self-aware and vulnerable even for you to look at that and to say, Hey, my ego is what's keeping me there. And what I'm hearing you say is, I guess there's almost two things in that story. Um, one is, it sounds like you're talking about in order to move towards what the future holds for someone, they need to let go of the past. That's sort of one thing. And then the second thing I heard you say was, don't let your ego be the reason you say you stay stuck. 100%. Yeah. And it's funny the reaction I got, because I would say about 50% of people were like, why would you do such a thing? Like, right. that's crazy. Like, what, what? do you have any idea how like lucky you are to be? You're, you're living your dreams. Like, why would you do that? And then 50% were like, oh yeah, that's Jeff. Like, you know, he, he did it. Like he's on to the next thing. Like when, if you look back at my career, I was doing, you know, uh, uh, street shows, right. And then from street shows or theme parks. And then I left theme parks to try to get on cruise ships. And then I left cruise ships to go to Disney and to Orlando. And then I left Orlando to come to Vegas. Right. So it's like, I, that's always been the way I, I have been. I've always been very forward thinking. And I do think it's so easy to get stuck. And I wasn't, I wasn't growing anymore. I wasn't growing as a business person because I figured out the Vegas game in the last few years, especially like, I was like, okay, I know what now how to fill up my showroom. And that was the challenge. And then I figured creatively I had done 
I had openers come in via Skype. I had a GoPro that I would strap to my head and do like juggle vision, you know, and show my view. I was doing cool things with technology. I, you know, again, I crowdfunded my set. Um, I was doing all sorts of like video interaction things. I was doing new bits. I was bringing, bringing different elements to, to the table. And uh, at a certain point, I just, I just thought, okay, I'm kind of stale creatively. Um, I need to go to a different medium, a different platform. So let's talk about adapting to change. Um, certainly everybody in the entire world has been impacted by what's happened with COVID and everything. You as uh, someone who was in the uh, live events business, both as a having your show mm -hmm. and then moving into, um, you know, emceeing events and speaking and things like that. It almost, I, I, I'm a little fuzzy on the exact timeline, but I think they lined up to where you ended your show kind of right before COVID yeah. happened. How did you, you were like, I'm going to be on all these stages now. And everyone's like, no, you're not <laughs> just kidding. Yeah. You know what? I, my timing has not always been great, but my timing for ending my Vegas show was incredible. Um, so my last show on the strip was December 19th. So I went home for Christmas and then, you know, COVID happened starting in, in January, you get kind of the, the tremors and, and everything in, in China. So what happened was I thought, okay, I'm going to, after 10 years, I'm going to take a beat and I'm going to think about like what I really, what do I really want to do? And whether that's write a book do more speaking, focus more on my nonprofit, focus more on the corporate market, focus on hosting. You know, there's a lot going on, making some online courses, maybe doing a, a seminar about how to produce a show in Las Vegas. There's all these performers that want to know about that marketing knowledge. So I thought about that. And then <laughs> obviously COVID happened and my source of income is shows still, right? Like it's, you know, it's people pay me to be at a certain stage at a certain date and time in a certain city. And my calendar was wiped. My calendar was wiped to zero. So all of my, just like everybody else's, right? All my income was gone. And so I kind of thought like, all right, I'm going to hold on the, the more, uh, you know, like, uh, what does Jeff want? Like, what is my next, what is my next 10 years going? I'm like, I need to figure out how to make money doing virtual because no matter what, that's going to be here to stay in some form. And I'm always going to be entertaining, hosting, speaking in some capacity. I need to like figure out virtual everything from creatively figure out how I can communicate, connect, do some of my bits, make new, create new bits, um, and then market it right. And execute it. So it's everything from home studio to, I used to use a different studio. Now I, I use a, a bigger studio in Las Vegas and um, how to package that and market it. So anyway, I kind of put my like life plans on hold uh, for for more of the what is what does my next phase look like and just figured out the virtual. Now here we are again at the start of 2021, and I'm very happy and comfortable doing virtual. Uh, took a few months to really figure it out, and it's it was still a great year for me um, financially and creatively, professionally. I, I enjoyed it. I uh, learned a lot. And now I'm actually starting to think, okay, now I've got virtual bookings sprinkled throughout 2021. They're coming in steadily. This is my income now supportive. So I'm getting back to like, what does Jeff want mm -hmm. now? Um, and I'm thinking about uh, some of the questions that I, I was literally thinking about uh, a year ago. And I will say uh, our friends from Video Narrative are producing a special for me right now. Um, about my show, my last show. It's kind of like, uh, it's like the last dance, but with more juggling and less basketball. But really, it's like 10 years on the strip, culminating in this last show. I had my final show videotaped with a three camera shoot at the Paris, Las Vegas after 10 years. And this is a kind of a cool a little, little teaser here. Uh, the street performer who picked me to be a volunteer when I was like 10 years old that started everything for me, I actually flew him out to Vegas for my final show and we performed together. We closed uh -huh. my last show after 10 years on this trip. So it was really cool. We got a sit down interview with him. Um, There's some emotional moments. Uh, we went to the hospital during the day and did a show for my nonprofit, Win Win Entertainment. We performed for the kids at the hospital. So we spent the day hanging out together and uh, it was just like the most perfect storybook close to, to my 10 year run. So anyway, that's, that's uh, something now that, Again, that, that project had been on hold for a year 
um, because the, the virtual thing, I just had to figure it out. And so now I'm getting back to like, you know what, I do want to commemorate that 10 year run on the strip with a special that I'd love to, to pitch to Netflix, Amazon, et cetera. So maybe, uh, maybe later this year, you'll, you'll see, uh, you'll be able to, to, to see my, the, the last dance, <laughs> the last juggle <laughs> in, in the last dance, Michael Jordan, like every episode said, and I took that personal and I'm, I'm looking forward to see what's going to be the thing that Jeff says. And, and so oh, yeah. I, I decided to do it differently. You're looking, <laughs> you're looking for the Scotty Pippen character, my, yeah. my assistant, my number two, who's like, yeah, who, who just kind of goes all out, gives the real deal. That's, yeah. That's great. <laughs> it's going to well, be very controversial, Ted. This, this special is going to be a lot, <laughs> a lot of buzz, a lot of controversy around the last Controversy juggle. sells. <laughs> <laughs> oh, last man. juggle. That's well, that's great. I mean, you know, hearing a couple a couple of themes, I think that I can extract out of what you just said that I think are really applicable to everyone listening are these ideas that sort of you had two things going on at the same time and you just switched between them based on the circumstances around you. One was you are you need to proactively be planning what your future is going to look like so that you can actually move towards it. But sometimes you have to change and adapt to what's happening immediately in front of you. you like your income went yeah. to zero which certainly happened to, uh, I mean, yeah. pretty much every industry had some degree of that. So and I, I, I'd like to say one more thing about that, Ted. Yeah. So yeah, it was interesting because seeing my peers react to COVID was very interesting to me. It, it was, uh, cause everyone obviously was in a very different situation and, and, uh, you know, people say like, you know, we're not in the same boat and we're in the same storm. Everybody's boat is different, which I agree with, right. Based on your personal professional situation, some, some guys are all like, oh, like I'm gonna spend more time with my wife and write my book. And it's like, great. And some some guys were like, I have four kids. Like I need to, you know, make money doing virtual shows, right? I need to embrace this. For, so it was very interesting to see, but um, I, I tried to just be analytical about it and thought, okay, so this is what I do. I, I am a, a presenter, I'm an entertainer, host, speaker, and I'm 30 something, and I'm gonna be doing this for like, a long time, right? And I really enjoy it. Even if I could retire, like I'm going to want to keep being in front of people, connecting with people. And I thought this clearly is going to be here to stay, right? Like live events will clearly come back, but virtual will also clearly be here to stay for some, some capacity. So I just thought about it as a strategic move to say, um, who knows what my life holds? Like if I get married, have kids, you know, maybe I would want to be able to do uh, more virtual shows, be in a studio, not have to travel as much, right? Maybe it's for a certain fee. You get me in person. A certain fee is is you'll you'll do it virtually, right? And so again, I think it's just having that long term thinking. Because um, I I've, I saw some guys in my world get really hurt because they were just thinking about it in like the next six months, um, and they weren't taking that longer term view. So again, just thinking about your biz and 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 your folks, like I think that's such an important important point too. We get so stuck in the like day to day, like what's you know what's my income this month, next month, at least as a freelancer, like I don't have a set, set job. So my, I'm constantly looking at my profit and loss statement every month and being like, oh, I need some more stuff in here. This back half of the year is great. But, um, but again, just zooming out and thinking like, what is, what is the next six months? If I really embrace this, what does that the next six months mean for like my next 10 years? Um, you know, could I, could I partner with a studio? Could I buy them out? Could I build my own studio? Could that I then could rent out so I'm talking about online courses. Maybe now I own the facility where the courses are being held and I rent out the spaces for, for speakers, for entertainers. Um, even just like helping the studio transition, they used to market mostly to entertainers, to shows, right? They're Britney Spears, the dancers would come there and learn their routines and practice. Now they're catering, they're marketing to corporations, to associations to bring them in and stream their events virtually to all their attendees because they see obviously that's that's happening now and that's that's their future. So anyway, I think that was that was a really good lesson. I was grateful to learn that I think at, at, at this age, right, to know to kind of get knocked on your ass like mm -hmm. you know when when you can recover and you can you know have the resiliency and the freedom and enough time to to figure it out because uh makes me think much more more about being in control of my business, right? I know as, as a freelancer, I get booked by a lot of third-party agencies, bureaus, production companies, and that's great. And I'm very grateful for all that work. 
But I also now have really started direct booking myself much more running Google ads, LinkedIn ads, Facebook ads, sales funnels, landing pages. Like I want to control my own destiny a little more because we saw when an external threat like coronavirus happens, you know, at the end of the day, it's like everybody's rightfully, like everybody's out for themselves, just kind of trying to keep their own lights on, keep their own function. So um, that was a, a really, it was a lesson I didn't want to learn. Um, but as a self-employed freelancer, I was really glad to learn it at this point in my career, um, as opposed to in another 20 or 30 years when I might not have the, the time or flexibility or resources to be, to be as uh, re- resilient. I like that, man. Take, take the lessons that life gives you, even if it's not the one that you're looking for, right? That's, that's yeah. powerful stuff. It's like 2020 right there. Yeah. So uh, I know we're running out of time here, but I definitely wanted to uh, ask you about win-win. So you started this nonprofit and maybe you could talk a little bit about, you know, why someone might do something like that. I mean, this certainly was a, it consumes your time and attention Mm -hmm. when, like you said, you don't have a consistent stream of income. It's not like you have a W-2 paycheck coming in. Um, How should other people be thinking about pursuing passion projects like that. And maybe you could just describe what the organization does. Sure. Yeah. So Women Entertainment is a 501c3. We're a national nonprofit and we exist to bring smiles to kids in children's hospitals. Um, and and I, I put the focus on the kids in the hospitals because before the focus was on the entertainers. It was like, we connect entertainers to children. But at the end of the day, now we bring smiles to, to kids who need them. How we do that has changed. It used to be through in-person visits by entertainers, athletes, celebrities. Now, of course, it's through virtual visits. So uh, we have 25 plus programs around the country at children's hospitals everywhere from you know Indiana, Charleston, New York, uh, Orange County, Phoenix, Reno, uh, Minneapolis, all, all over the country. And what's even cooler now is we have performers from all over the country because before, you would have to have a performer like in Las Vegas go to a Las Vegas children's hospital. Now we can have a performer in Columbus, Ohio, you know, zoom in to uh, Phoenix Children's Hospital, right? Which is pretty awesome. So we've really exploded in growth in the last year. Um, definitely a silver lining um, in, in my world of all this is that Women Entertainment, my nonprofit, has just uh, as I said, just exploded both in the hospitals that we serve, the number of hospitals that we serve, because now none of them have external programming, right? They can't have patients, visitors. So they they need what we do. And now performers have a lot more time to, to be able to uh, to give to for these virtual shows. So that question of access now, like everyone has access, both both parties. So we existed to, to connect these two parties that both had something to, to give to help the other. And now the access is so easy um, that it's just been really, really wonderful. It's been a nice silver lining. Um, as far as like how I've done it. So again, gets back to the passion. Like I'm so into win-win entertainment and I'm so happy with it and proud of it uh, that I just become this kind of evangelist, this ambassador for women entertainment and people have just gotten involved. Um, people have just, uh, pe- people want to be involved in projects that generate good energy and excitement. And they want to be around people who are full of life and really enjoying what they do. So I'm proud that we don't have any paid staff. We don't pay any performers, anything. We're hundred percent volunteer. And that's pretty remarkable when, when I think about the amount of, of visits that we've, we've done. I mean, we're, we, we have a lives touch document. We always update. And I mean, we're like, you know, way over 80,000 lives touched, you know, having done this now for 10 years. So um, yeah, I would say say the the advice, or at least just a, a thought, is that women entertainment is not directly involved with what I do. Like I'm a corporate event speaker, entertainer, host, and this is sending professional entertainers uh, to children's hospitals in person or virtually. So it's not directly related, but it's tangentially related. And I think that's important because all of all of the stuff I do for my for profit world naturally helps my nonprofit world, right? I do a corporate show for FedEx office. I sit next to the CEO on the flight back from Portugal 
He learns all about win-win entertainment. Now FedEx office prints all of our flyers and slides them under the kids' rooms, you know, to, to tell them what performer's coming, right? Because obviously we connected in my, my for-profit world, right? So I think as my for-profit career has grown, the nonprofit has grown as well because I have access to more performers. When I had my show on the strip, you know, I think more, I was able to, to meet more performers, more performers knew who I was and they knew like, oh yeah, Jeff's women entertainment is his thing. Like he's, he's all about that. And, uh, I think it just naturally got people excited for it. Um, I think appreciation is a big part of it. We talk now about how to, how to show appreciation to our entertainers. You do one free show, you get a t-shirt. Uh, and then after that, you get this series of badges, right? So you get a badge after you hit 10, 25, 50. And then after a hundred hospital visits, you're in the century club. Um, you know, we give out entertainer of the year awards for every city. Um, so we really like to recognize people for their, for their philanthropy. Um, same thing with the board. We try to recognize board members, volunteers, donors, everybody who donates gets a handwritten thank you and, um, and all that. So, uh, yeah, I don't know if I, that was just kind of a, a general brain dump on, on win-win entertainment. Yeah. I mean, there are definitely a lot of things. Uh, applicable things come out of that. I mean, certainly the way you started talking about, you know, finding a silver lining in a otherwise dire situation. I mean, I think that's something we all can think about and apply like, oh, we're in this, you know, revenues are down, customers are whatever the issue is, there is an opportunity to adapt and to pivot slightly. Um, and it also, I think strategically, even though I know you didn't start win-win as a strategic thing to help your career, you did it because you're a passionate person, but yeah. doing something that is, uh, adjacent to what your profession yeah. is, it help both help each other. And that's a really efficient way to think about utilization of time is if you're going to help yeah. the world, help it in a way that can kind of have this multiplying effect is what I'm kind of hearing you say. Absolutely. And I, I wrote a blog post on this about, about kind of why volunteering and one of the biggest sense, right, why volunteer right now? One of the biggest themes that keeps coming up is it gives you a sense of control in a world that is seemingly out of control, right? So things are like absolutely insane right now and it seems like the world's spinning out of control, but volunteering gives you a sense of agency of like, I did what I could for my little corner of the world to like make the world a better place today, right? So when you when you do that, when you volunteer, I feel like it not only gives you this perspective and this kind of shot like in the arm of, of zeal for life and, and fulfillment, but it also just kind of, gives you that sense that you're still in control of your life. You still have the ability to impact people in a positive way, to affect people, to make the world a little bit brighter in, in whatever way you, you choose to do. And I think that's really important for all of us to, to remember right now and, and to embrace largely for our mental health, right? Because it's, it's just such an insane time. That's awesome, man. Well, as we, as we wrap up here, thanks so much for being on the show. You're, first of all, amazing and hilarious as always uh is there <laughs> any uh yeah. any parting wisdom any last one thing you want to leave everybody with before we sign off well i just realized that my mic is not attached <laughs> jeff so is holding up his microphone me. without yeah i'm holding up my yeah for those uh yeah for those just listening yes my fancy microphone is not attached but i do look cool right <laughs> Fancy uh, radio mic, um, and and I had brought this shrubbery that I was I was uh, hoping to to work in here somewhere, but I didn't get it on. anyway. Um, yeah, so part man, parting wisdom. Uh, I, I would say probably the passion part, man. About about instead of trying to find a passionate project, just work on becoming a more passionate person, and the projects will naturally take care of themselves. I think that's a really I think that's a really important point. I think people kind of look for that as as the initiator of the passion. Like, what's that one thing that I just love so much? And that's the wrong way of thinking about it. Um, I think that, that, again, it's really more a result of, of who you are at your core. And uh, that's going to be more enjoyable. And I think you're going to make a, a bigger impact uh, thinking about it that way. Awesome, man. Well, thanks so much for the wisdom and the time today. Always good catching up with you, my friend. And uh, we'll talk soon. And, and for everyone else Absolutely. listening, if you want to learn more about the show or, or appear as a guest, go to tedharrington.com backslash podcast. We'll catch you next time. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Tech Done Different Podcast with Ted Harrington. If you learned something new and this conversation made you think, then share itspmagazine.com with your friends, family, and colleagues. 
If you represent a company and wish to associate your brand with our conversations, sponsor one or more of our podcast channels. We hope you will come back for more stories and follow us on our journey. You can always find us at the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society.